Well, welcome everyone to Holy Digressions. We are very excited to be here with you today. As you probably know, this channel is just getting started, so please make sure you like, comment, and subscribe on this video and on this channel so we can grow our viewer base. But today, I'm very excited to have a very special guest, Father Darren P. Balky, a newly ordained priest for the Diocese of Charlotte. You've been ordained for how long now? I just passed four months earlier this week. Just passed four months, which is very exciting. So thank you so much for your yes to your vocation and for all the, the good that you do here in the Diocese of Charlotte. And where are you stationed right now? Tell us a little bit about kind of the early parts of your ministry. Yeah, the the brand new priest life. Um, I think probably a married person would feel much the same where you spend about 90 days just figuring out what in the world just happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it shifts into building a routine. And so I'm just on that front end of a routine, and I'm serving at St. Leo the Great Catholic Church, which is in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And for those of you at home that do not know, Father Balky and I have a great relationship going back to college. We were roommates and sweet mates for three years in college. Yeah. But then Father Balky was the best man at my wedding. So we have a wonderful relationship, and I'm so thankful that Father Balky is here and able to chat with us today. Yeah. So we're going to be doing a little bit of an introductory course today, a little bit of introductory to canon law. And Mm -hmm. the reason why I want to do introductory early on here is the hope is to have many conversations about some of the intricacies of canon law later on, because there's a lot of really great things in canon law. But Father Bulky has agreed with to chat about canon law today. Now, disclaimer, neither of us are canon lawyers. Not a canon lawyer. I am not a canon lawyer. We are neither canon lawyers. However, Father Bulky has a lot of classroom experience, education with canon law. I have a little bit more lived experience with canon law just because I've been working in the parish longer than Father Bulky has. But ultimately, we're just going to be two friends having a conversation about what is canon law and why it applies to you, me, and Father Bulky. So you ready to dive in? It's a quick flyover to try to get a general orientation. Let's jump in. All right. So Father Bulky. Give me the canon law 101 of what is canon law. You know, regurgitate something your professor said in class at some point. Sure. So canon law as a document of the church is the organizing document, right? We have all sorts of documents in the church that tell us what something does or um, describe a way that we pray, right? So they're they're instructional, but what keeps the body of the church together? How do we know when we're in the body or out of the body? And how is everything supposed to be working for that body to hold together mm-hmm. um, for the sake of our salvation is really what the law does. Um, if you showed up to a brand new job and someone said, all right, well, please just go ahead and get started. You might have some idea based off of what the job posting was or what friends had told you, but you would really want your boss to say, here's what we're doing today, and here's the things we're going to expect from you. Mm -hmm. And we'll know that we're doing well because we make this happen or we help our customers with this. In the same way, the church has to have some, some of the mission of the gospel detailed out so we can actually embrace it mm-hmm. and carry it out. Um, and so that's what canon law does for the church. So who is it applying to? Who, who is supposed to be following this law? Sure. So canon law as a whole applies to Catholics. Mm-hmm. So when you're baptized in the Catholic church, um, you therefore are subject to the law. Um, and then within it, there are subsections that deal with different groups are religious, are clergy, those who are married, right? And and different rights and responsibilities come along with that. Mm-hmm. But to start off, people who are in the Roman Catholic Church are subject to the Code of Canon Law. Now, most people don't know about this canon law, right? Most people are living their lives, and this is partly why we're doing this episode on canon law, because it is so important for all faithful sure. Catholics. So... What actually, give us an example of what might apply to my day-to-day life, or maybe your day-to-day life, because that actually would be a little bit different with you as a clergy member and me as a a lay member of the church. Great example. Father, my grandma is sick. Would you be able to do Mass for her? 
Mm -hmm. Well, the law reinforces and requires that if the priest agrees to offer Mass, he must. Okay. Right? The faith will have a right to the sacraments, to being helped through what the church does, in this case, by praying the Mass. So that word of the priest becomes sacred, right? But it would also um, have things to do with how we get ready for marriage, for instance, Mm -hmm. Um, where the church collection goes and and who's responsible for it, how decisions are handled between the pope and the bishops and your local pastor. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's it's a how-to guide. In a lot of ways, it gives a roadmap for sort of working through all the the daily situations, um, but at a general level, right, in a way that the whole church can appreciate, um, but then that leaves space to match the situation wherever you are. And something that I use in Canon Law on a daily basis is about, maybe not daily basis, weekly basis, is about the sacraments. There's a lot of kind of the how to perform the sacrament, what the sacrament actually is doing, um, how to be prepared for the sacrament, and it goes through all, all seven of them. I mean, sure. I'm mostly looking at baptism, confirmation, first communion, and then marriage right. on a case-by-case basis. But those are... So when people ask, like, well, why do I have to do this? Or why do I have to do that? Right. The hope is that my foundation of what I'm saying, why I'm saying these things, is actually in canon law. Because that's actually what we are required to follow. Absolutely. And fulfill. Yeah. And it's nice to know that the code of canon law exists because... That means we're just not making crap up, right? Right. You don't have to start from square one. You just every can't time. show up and say, "All right, baptism today. Let's see how we do it today." No, actually, there's specific guidelines, specific things you have to do in order for the baptism to actually be a baptism. Right. And a, a great example, you know, it's easy to look at law and say, "Oh, it's restrictive. It's prohibitive. It's they're just chaining me in with all these things I can't do." And many priests that I know who are trained in canon law will say, well, those laws all exist because a situation came up where the need for guidance Mm -hmm. was there, right? Even to the point where some of them are so specific, you might actually be able to guess it. Who might have been in that first situation where we didn't have a plan of how to work through it? Mm -hmm. Um, And so it gives those reminders and steps and, yeah, just context to actually go about things the right way, where we can be fair, where we can be consistent with how we take care of people, um, and to further the growth of the church and make people holy. Yeah. Now, is canon law dead? Is this a document that we that was written, you know, 500 years ago and it hasn't moved or changed a bit? Sure. Um, what What's kind of, how is the document changing or growing as the church changes? And right. Well, so something a lot of folks don't even think about is that the edition of canon law that we're working with Mm -hmm. um, was published in 1983. So in the industry of canon law, most people call it the 83 code, Mm -hmm. right? Just like you would have an 83 automobile. And that's actually what I have right here, the 83 code. Um, But this is actually kind of outdated at this point. It's very outdated. Yeah, I actually, the reason I brought my phone into the studio today is because I really can't functionally remain just in the hard copy because I will show you here. So quickly. This is the list of revisions, um, and these are all between 2015 and present, I how, think. Just tell us how many do you think you are on that list right there? So 2015 to present. I bet there's, oh, I don't know, 25? 25, 25 revisions. Major revisions, sometimes with whole chapters or sections of things. And that's just, you said 2015, so that's just within the last seven years. Right, right. So canon law historically got its start um, in actually being formulated and brought into a book under Pius IX and uh, Benedict, I think that would be the 15th. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was the 1917 edition. That was the first time we really, as the church, got everything together and written down. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of things, there were a lot of things that were commonly held and understood across the universal church, but no one just had a book that could point to. But it's interesting that it took 1,917 years for us to even get to that point of codifying it. Right. 
as a universal document. Yes. So that's already a more recent thing. Mm -hmm. But the Code of Canon Law is actually the final document of the Second Vatican Council. Mm -hmm. So across all of the different changes and reforms and movements that came forth from the Second Vatican Council, it was an obvious understanding, as, as all of these arrangements were made, that we would need to help the law reflect that and to promulgate, set forth a new edition. Yeah. Because much would have changed even from that 1917 collection. Mm -hmm. And so even though the council, the Second Vatican Council convened in the 60s, it took another 23 years all the way into the papacy of John Paul II before the Code of Canon Law was brought into its general form that we use today and has now already been modified numerous times. So what are these modifications? Who has the right to do these modifications? And how would you and I see these modifications kind of come out in the day-to-day -day basis in the church? And how would sure. we know these things are changing? The modification to the code of canon law across the whole church is reserved to the Pope himself. Mm -hmm. Because he has an enormous global responsibility he will specify specific offices that will prepare and work with issues that, that he senses need more attention mm -hmm. um, or refinement. And so there are groups such as the Pontifical Academy of Legislative Texts. Mm -hmm. um, just like in the United States, we would say government has three branches, right? The exercise of authority in the church is executive and legislative and judicial mm -hmm. as well. And so along those lines, we have a Supreme Court, as it were, in the church, and that's the top judicial power, right? And that's called the Roman Rota. Um, and, and they're obviously, just like our Supreme Court, interpreting this document. This exactly. They're trying law. to make the best application of things that have been brought up through and appealed to them mm -hmm. to match what's going on with the document. They're not going to modify the document, but in their jurisprudence and their work, they're going to make known shortcomings that they encounter. And how it should be interpreted when there's some sections that aren't as clear. Exactly. So in 1983, there was no such thing as a smartphone. Mm-hmm. Because smartphones have microphones, they have the potential to record. Mm -hmm. So up until very recently, it was penalized, obviously, in the code that the seal of confession had to be kept by the confessor. A penitent can go out and say anything about their confession afterwards, but the, the priest is always going to guard that seal. Mm -hmm. Very recently now, the code has actually put down in an official revision, okay, it is a grave problem to record by means of technology. Because no one knew the word iPhone when the 83 code came out. Of course. But we have to be thoughtful and attentive to guard the sacredness of the seal um, and to, to never violate the secrecy that is enjoyed so a person can actually receive the help of the sacrament um, without having to be exposed mm -hmm. in, in order to, to receive the forgiveness of their sins. And so you've got this, you said Rhoda, like the judiciary. Roman Rhoda. Roman Rhoda, this judici judiciary branch of kind of Vatican law, obviously the Pope being more of the executive to her executive branch. Primarily, yes. And so he is the one that is ultimately going to publish actual changes into the can into Correct. canon law and these are called modu proprios i don't know what that is how that translates to english do you know the um english translation of that i mean i think it's a proper motion meaning like of a specific motion mm -hmm. like a court would file we want a motion for um this trial to be delayed that would make sense right and so you you're not changing the trial you're not changing who's involved but you're saying we need two more weeks Mm -hmm. Right, so a modo proprio um, gives you a specific modification. And 
Pope Francis has made a lot of these modifications recently. Mm-hmm. Um, I think more than any Pope prior, which we're only going back to 1917 when the code was officially... In that sense, yes. Yeah, in that sense. <laughs> right. Um, obviously, there was a ton of changes that were made prior to 1917, but since it's been right. codified, um, he's been making a lot of changes. And that has um, been interesting in for this sure. life of the church. Probably right. as for you as a priest and for me as somebody who works for the church... Most of these things don't apply to my day or day life, and honestly, most of them don't even apply to your daily life. But every once in a while, there is a change that really can make some uh, make some right. waves there. If somebody's unhappy with a change or a little bit disgruntled with the changes, um, or maybe they love the changes, I don't know. Right. But either way, how should we as the faithful be looking at, and what's the perspective that we should have towards these motu proprios that come out? Sure, I'll bring up the exact text because I think it's very helpful. The Code of Canon Law has thousands and thousands of canons. Uh, I think, well, thousands of thousands. An individual law is called a canon in mm-hmm. the Code of Canon Law. That's probably helpful to mention. It's also a nice church document because it includes a glossary at mm-hmm. the end. Very few church documents tell you how to define the terms that they use, so that's refreshing <laughs> for you know a reader who's coming into something new. But at the very end, it's working through um, processes for um, if certain officials aren't able to function in their office. But canon 1752, the very last canon, mm-hmm. says in these cases, etc., etc. And then it concludes, always observing canonical equity and keeping in mind the salvation of souls, which in the church must always be the supreme law. Mm. So, we, as the faithful, as clergy, however we're members of the Roman Catholic Church, should be looking for the possibility of salvation mm-hmm. and asking, how can this text, how can this canon point me in the right direction? What do I have to cooperate with? Where, where do I have a question? Right? So not only obedience to the church but mm-hmm. actually obedience to our lord who's going to be the one to save us yeah the whole church is an instrument in the hand of christ right extending his presence in the world bringing the sacraments proclaiming his word all for the sake of our salvation so if we lose track of salvation because of something that irritates us or oh, i can't believe i have to get three copies of this i you know that's a lot of a lot of paperwork well, it's a lot of paperwork, but we're not trying to get to paperwork. We're trying to get to the salvation of souls. Mm-hmm. And we would never want to overlook something important or brush something aside that might be at the heart of someone's life mm-hmm. um, because that's going to be the best way to help them. And I think you made a very good point about our Lord ultimately being the one leading the church, but he also gave authority to Peter Exactly. Right, with the keys to bind and loose. So this is a big part of the binding and loosing that the Pope, as the successor of Peter, has the authority to do, given by Christ, sure. and that binding and loosing that we, the church here on earth, um, are able to do is recognized by Christ in heaven. Right. Right. So this uh so this code of canon law, you might say, ah, it's just a Human creation, what did Jesus have to do with this thing? It wasn't only created, right. it wasn't only codified until 1917. Well, actually, Jesus gave the church the authority to do this, and he recognizes right. that, that authority in heaven. So there is a close connection there that we have to recognize, but I think you said it the best right there when you said, it's about the salvation of souls. This mm-hmm. this wouldn't exist if we didn't have the salvation of souls in mind, I wouldn't be using it. You wouldn't be using it. We wouldn't care at all, except we know that this is how an important tool to help people be saved. Sure. And I always think, you know, the Lord was present through the four accounts of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. And he's handing it down. He's there. And passion, death, resurrection, it's all together. When you switch to the Acts of the Apostles, the protagonist, the leader is the Holy Spirit. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, you can tell right away the church needed that Holy Spirit because all of a sudden we've got legal disputes about Gentiles and Jews and who can come in and to hold your previous faith. And 
it's our CIA questions. What are we allowed to eat? Do we still have to have exactly. circumcision? All these, actually, apostles' questions. Yeah. Yeah. What language are we going to use? Who's approved to be a missionary? These are all things right from the very beginning mm -hmm. that the early church understood. And when the Lord breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit, he's equipping the apostles to navigate all these things that we now find in the code. Mm -hmm. So from a spiritual perspective, right? Let's do a little bit of spiritual direction here. If somebody was going to come to you and say, all right, so I hear about this code thing. What am I supposed to do with this spiritually or in my own life? Do I, do I sit down and read it cover to cover? Do I read parts of it? Do I just trust that the church is using it appropriately? Right. Like, if somebody was concerned that I never knew this thing existed, how does this apply to my spiritual life? What would your kind of pastoral, sure. pastoral sharing be? If you sure. Will? You could think of um, the code like a shopper's club. That's a rather crass analogy, right? Okay. But you don't wake up and every time you go into the shopper's club, Sam's club, Costco, uh, BJ's, any of these big ones, right? You wouldn't always go in looking for a kayak. They probably have kayaks at a lot of these places but that's a really specific tool mm -hmm. they also have meat departments and that's that's pretty common that you know it's, it's a good way to select good meat so i try to approach the code as use it to track down the answers that apply for where you are right now mm -hmm. if you're preparing for marriage it can be helpful to understand sort of the big picture of that. And many priests, when they work with couples, even though they're not sitting down and doing a canon by canon review of canon law, are keeping in the back of their mind, how am I helping this person meet those expectations of the law, but in a way that's productive for their spiritual life, mm -hmm. right? That, that grows their sense of holiness and their movement towards salvation. Um, so, Cover to cover, it's not a page turner. No, it's it's a it's, little dry. It's very dry. No one reads the motor vehicle code, code to code, unless they're a traffic enforcement officer, you mm -hmm. know, or a state trooper. Those are the sort of people who need to read it. But if you got a speeding ticket, you might say, you know what, I'm just I'm gonna look that up mm -hmm. and just sort of understand what's going on there. And you might read the lines before it and the lines after it, just to okay, mm -hmm. Th that that's where this is. I I sort of see where this is coming from. Still not happy I got a ticket. Probably need to slow down. But it it makes a little more sense now. At least I can see the reasoning behind it. Exactly. And and that can be helpful, right? It's, it's So it's a resource. It's a resource to be consulted. Um, I would not get it out and read it before dinner or, you know, do, do three pages of canon law before going to bed um, or use it to preview the Sunday gospel. Yeah. Those, those, those are all not other books, practical. different things. Yes. Yeah. But some, some key areas that you might suggest on reading, as we kind of already said, the sacraments are, are big. Anytime sure. you're preparing for a sacrament, it's really awesome to read up on that section. And any one sacrament, marriage is quite a bit longer, and I think sure. holy orders is quite a bit longer because there's more ins and outs and details right. to get straight. But baptism, first communion, confirmation, those are actually very manageable chunks of canon law that yeah. are actually not too bad to read. They, yeah. they make a lot of sense and apply very... Um, concretely uh, another section i like to read is kind of on uh, the liturgical year they've got some mm, understanding yep. of um, how the year works and different feast days um, also some the fasting obligations that we we have right. so for like lent when lent comes around saying okay what does the church actually say in canon law sure about what i'm supposed to be doing during lent um there are, so there are some very practical moments where i would say hey yeah Pull out those canons, do some research, right. and even if it's just to familiarize yourself that, hey, this law exists, and I'm going to try to use it every once in a while, um, just to see how it flows and how it reads and how to use it. So when I do run into something that, hey, I really need to figure out what the church is saying on this, you're not you know, searching in the dark. You've sure. got some understanding of what to do. Another great tip for fruitful reflection on the code is... The catechism, a lot of times in its footnotes, mm -hmm. will give a little nudge and say, oh, and this came from a canon. Well, if you're reading in the catechism, a lot of people might do catechism in a year or Bible in a year, right? As you, as you come up with a question, 
Well, when you get that off the off the shelf, you could say, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna look up what this can is and just sort of see what that meant," mm -hmm. because obviously the catechism is in conformity with canon law, mm -hmm. right? They're different tools to help in the same project, but one's for teaching and one's for organizing the faith, and so as you as you see that, that can give a little bit of depth and insight um, where you're not trying to read the whole code, but you have a really specific passage um, and you can see sort of the roots underneath of what the catechism gives us. For and the life. catechism is, is a little bit easier to read cover to cover. So that is, is kind of an enjoyable read that you could read before exactly. bed or preparing for a Sunday exactly. homily. Um, and then, as you suggested, you see the citations and then you, oh, hey, let me pull out the canon law. Exactly. Now, most people at home don't have a book of canon law. So what is your suggestion about the best place to find canon law? Let's sure. say on your phone or on whatever electronic device you're using. Yeah. Where do you go? There are two great internet resources that I consult frequently. The one I had pulled up earlier is actually a Google document. Mm -hmm. oh, well, a Google Drive upload of a PDF. It's great because it's text searchable, mm -hmm. um, and it tells you what all the revisions are. Um, and that's produced by the Canon Law Society of Great Britain and Ireland. Hmm. Why do you use Great Britain and Ireland? They're just they're just simple and British about it. Okay. I mean they they're just they're very succinct. They tell you exactly what it is. Um, it's super easy to navigate their mm -hmm. page, um, and I think you can just type Canon Law Abstracts, which is like their law journal, um, into Google, and then it's the first hit that comes up because they're great and they're British, and they optimize their SEO, and then they uh, they say you know click here for a full copy of the code including revisions. Um, it's right in the middle of the main page. So that's very easy. And I'll tag any links that we talk about here in the description below, or I might even put some cards up in the corners. Who knows? Right. We'll see how, how tech savvy I get. Sure. And then the, uh, the other one is uh, the Gregorian University over in Rome. Mm -hmm. This one's especially impressive because you can pull up the whole code or books or sections. You can... And this is like the geek level of things. You can tell it, I want the code only up until this 2006 revision. Mm. And you can actually look side by side at what was the change or why did this get its own little subheading? And that was the main canon. Um, but you can also do, I think there's eight or nine languages on there, mm. including the original Latin. So it gives you a way to see all of that side by side. And I, I try to stay sharp with that because sometimes you'll encounter a Spanish speaker, for instance. I'm not going to try to give a concept of the law in whatever roughshod translation I can give in the moment. Mm -hmm. I can say, you know what? Momentito, por favor. Do the right thing. Look up the correct answer and give them that response exactly how the church herself speaks. In, in Spanish. In Spanish. Because we haven't really talked about this, but canon law is ultimately a Latin document that is sure. translated. Exactly. So it starts as what would be called the typical edition, which is the, you know, the broad sent everywhere Latin. And then um, the, the Holy See goes about translating that into an approved translation for each language. Yeah. So English, French, Spanish, fill in the blank language. It's ultimately being translated from the Latin. From the Latin. So it would do a disservice if you said, okay, I'm going to take the English that I understand and translate it myself into Spanish. Right. You need to use the proper translation from the Latin text exactly. to Spanish to get the correct understanding of the text. Exactly. And that's, that's really helpful for someone when I might have an expectation that they for instance, fill out a form before they get married. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not saying as, oh, and also we have some paperwork and have fun. I'm saying, here's what we're trying to do in the church to help you. Mm -hmm. And this form is our way of, of going into that. Right? So I'm supporting something that they can understand in how the church speaks instead of telling them, well, this is sort of important and I don't, I don't know exactly how I would say it, but, but just, just get this done. Mm -hmm. 
right? That, I think that's a little irresponsible, you know, if that's all the more I can give you. So I, I like to have that. Um, so that's the Gregorian University. Um, I, I would just, yeah, I'll find you a link. And yeah, I'll put, I'll put the we'll link put it down there, below. It's very impressive. So another question for you. Here in the Dice of Charlotte, right? We do have kind of a judicial branch here just Correct. within our own diocese, right? Mm-hmm. So what are some things that people might run into regarding our location? Or if you were working with a couple who might needed to go to uh, the office in the diocese or communicate with them, what are some of the, the things that you might say preliminary of, hey, so here's how this is going to work. Here's the people you might end up talking to. And here's what their kind of office does. Right, right. So a really good basic principle is being able to correctly identify and diagnose is really important to good law, Mm -hmm. whether that's in civil or church settings. So a really important thing that the church does when she works with any situation in the law is there's a responsibility for records and documentation, Mm -hmm. right? And we actually are required, every diocese is required to appoint someone as chancellor. And that person's responsible for keeping records of certain decisions and documents and communications and all those things. Mm -hmm. Be your own chancellor. Yeah. When you come to your parish, say, because someone's, you know, needing to get confirmation or um, something like that, say, well, let's see, what what documents do I have in our family fire safe mm-hmm. or, or in our folder where we keep all of our things for church? Let's start with that and, and see what I have. You may not be able to bring it with you. You might be traveling. There might be something else going on, but you could at least say, okay, well, I have a little table of contents or I know on this sticky note I have a baptism certificate from when I did my first communion in this. Mm-hmm. So it lets you know where you're starting from. And that, that's a huge help, right, um, to, to understand what's already documented, mm-hmm. right? Because the church wants to start with all the momentum of, of everything that has been done for your salvation already and then build on that. And we need to participate in our own salvation, even yeah. when it comes to the law, and not just expect higher-ups to... Sure. Keep track of it for us all the time. So, you know, a simple frustrating situation. Okay, I want to, you know, do first communion for my child at this parish. Okay, are you able to to find their baptismal record? I don't know. Well, the rest of that conversation is someone from the parish helping that person find out how to know. Yeah. If you did your research ahead of time, you could say, I didn't find anything when we looked in the house, but I know the parish that we were at during those years. Do you think that could work if we could try to find something? Mm -hmm. Or even more extra credit, I called the parish where we were when I think they were baptized, um, and they're going to get back to us. And here's the name of the person I was talking with to try to find it. Already... You're a participant in your own salvation, mm-hmm. right? Because you've you've brought in the the best that you have so far. You don't have to be perfect when you show up. In fact, the church is here because none of us are perfect. Yeah, that's why we have the law. We to need it. With. We need it, and the law helps to keep us inside the lines and move us in the right direction. So, um, by just saying, "Well, here's the basics. Here's what I was able to find, and this I didn't find." Um, and here's the questions I've asked so far, um, is, is a huge help. Mm-hmm. It'll it'll actually speed things up a lot because, remember, when you walk into the church or approach uh, the diocese um, with any sort of concern that involves the law, they have to ask all of these questions if you haven't asked some of them already. Mm-hmm. So just by saying, well, where are we starting? Who's involved? What's the name of the parish? Do we have any documents? I think those are great starting points, mm-hmm. and I would certainly very much respect that. Yeah. I'd appreciate it if someone came in knowing what content they had and also the gaps. 
that that were tripping them up. Mm-hmm. That that can be really good. Nice. All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap up this conversation. The last question for you. Anything else do you think is important to tell the viewers at home about canon law? Hmm. Anything else that you feel like we've kind of missed or people should keep in mind when reflecting on thinking about reading parts of canon law um, kind of on a, a in practice for them? Sure. So one one really good principle of law, again, it applies in the church, but beyond it is you can't write a law about literally everything, mm-hmm. right? We can't write a law about Fridays in October when you're in the middle of a podcast with a person you went to college with. The church would never do that. There might be a law about media in the church or some relationship of a cleric to a layperson, mm-hmm. some basics. But know that every person, when they approach the law, is trying to do the best to fit the principle onto a situation. And that situation isn't just a task that needs to get dealt with. It's a person Mm -hmm. or several people. And it's about their salvation. And it it counts, right? There are souls on the line. And so sometimes it can can be frustrating if you're waiting um, and, you know, you're why can't they just make a decision on this? Or um, I, I thought I sent that to them already. Didn't they get it? Well, there might be other checks or things that go with that. Um, do be persistent, but don't be bothersome, right? Be praying for the intention of those people who have to navigate those things um, and read the law with that generous ear, right? That, that we're not going to have everything all figured out but most things will know where to start mm-hmm. and will have a way to go forward. Um, and then that I think that's that's a lot more freeing and understanding of the law, right? It's, it's a whole pile of resources, um, but we have to respect that there's going to be some work to, to navigate it mm-hmm. um, and to find the correct application and make sure that we're not missing a step mm-hmm. um, so that, so that, when we come forward with a sacrament or, or a situation, we're able to really give someone the very best um, instead of limiting ourselves to the first thing we find mm-hmm. that has a word about them in it. Yeah. And, and so not only for the easy answer, but for the right answer, the helpful answer. And as you have already said, participate yourself. Know sure. a little bit of the law. Know what the faithful's responsibility is because then that's going to – cut out a lot of the mm-hmm. ins and outs and you've got to learn the whole system. If you're like, hey, I have a just a basic understanding of what's going on here, great. And then when you're asked or told to do something, such as find a certificate or fill out this paperwork, do these things, do it. Participate. Sure. Right? Because these things aren't just for fun, right? right? We don't make people fill out paperwork just because it's enjoyable to watch people sign their name and date another piece of paper. Not one bit. It's because it's required by the church because they saw a lack of the, there was a lack at one point that needed to be changed. Mm -hmm. And we do this in order to have the proper paper trail, the proper records and the proper I's dotted T's crossed so that we could follow the law. Well, so that we could save souls more efficiently and effectively in these judicial matters right? and so that we could best help people um, and make sure everything is in line. So the next priest that comes along, because we have to realize and understand that priests and bishops, they don't stay in the position forever, right? right? This is very fluid. It changes from hands to hand. So we need to have the best records and best paper trail possible. So when that's handed off to the next person, that yep. could be a seamless transition because it happens all the time. Hey, I need a baptismal record from New York. I call New York, and maybe they did something differently than they're yeah. supposed to do. Or they did something just flat out wrong. It happens from time to time. We're, not, we're not taking a slate of people from New York. I'm not That's a place where this could happen. I'm not taking a specific church. I'm just saying, as an example, because I called them the other day. I'm not saying they did anything wrong, but New York was the front of my mind because I did call about a baptismal record. Um we're like, ah, oh, just just follow the law. That makes my job a whole lot either easier down in North Carolina. And we try to follow the law the best we can. So when we need to send records to sure. Mexico, because we send a lot to Mexico, 
um, there as prepared as possible. But we're all working together, and so we're all working yep. from the same playbook. The faithful, the churches, the diocese, the bishops, the priests, everyone's working from the same playbook. Exactly. It just runs so much smoother. Yeah. So, yeah. awesome. Well, thank you so much, Father Balky. Absolutely. For being here. I'm sure we will have you on the uh, show in the future. You come down from Winston every once in a while. I'll do what I can. So, Looking forward to more. And thank you all for viewing at home. As I said before, like, comment, subscribe. Check out the notes in the bottom for the links that Father Balky will share with me. And we will be talking about canon law more in the future. So please stay tuned.